We're at the next to last lesson in the book of signs, uh, the 31 undeniable prophecies of the apocalypse. And so uh, tonight our focus is going to be new heaven and a new earth. And the first point on our outline is the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, for this first passage we're going to look at is in Psalm, the Psalm, Psalm 102, Psalm 102 and verses uh, 23 through 27. In this Psalm we're going to see the eternality of God and, and the heavens and the earth perishing in this passage. In Psalm 102, in verse 23, he was, weak, uh, he was weakened my strength in the way. He has shortened my days. I say, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. Of old you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing you will change them and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now there's a very important point. We hear all the time about climate change. About every day in the news, you're going to hear that. Uh, you either read it in the papers or you hear it constantly. And we think about, and, and one of the things a lot of times comes out of that is, oh, you know, uh, man is going to do this and this if we don't stop you know, this aspect, this is what's going to be happening and all the things. The scriptures teaches us there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth that the current, and we're going to be looking at this tonight, as Second Peter 3 describes, uh, the idea of, of the current uh, heavens and earth that will, be, will perish. But it's not going to be from man-made climate change. You know, when you hear the, the doomsday and, and the various things, that gives man too much credit. You know what? When I say credit, the idea of that man has that power, and man doesn't have that power. We look to the Lord. The Lord not only created the heavens and the earth, but He sustains the creation. He sustains. He's the sustainer, as Colossians 1 says. So what we think about the eternality of God in the heavens and the earth perishing. And it says in, in verse 27, you are the same and your years will not, will not come to an end. And when we think about that very truth, God's eternal, but the current heavens and earth are not. Forever your word is settled in heaven, O Lord. Your word is settled but the current heavens and earth will, as verse 26 says, they will perish, but you endure. On, and all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed. So who's going to bring the current heavens and earth to an end? It's not man. Almighty God will on his timetable. Time God will in his timetable. And, and God doesn't need man to do that. God has the power. He doesn't need man to do the end of with the earth and, and the heavens. Let's look at Isaiah 65 because the prophets of the Old Testament. We're going to see Isaiah, but you have others that say this similar in with the day of the Lord and the minor prophets what they have prophesied. But let's look at Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Isaiah 65, 17, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. 
the new is going to be so fabulous that the old doesn't even come to mind. That's a promise. Go to Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. So you see the promise of a new heaven and a new earth. Go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells righteousness dwells we're looking for new heavens and a new earth so we see the very first point the promise of a new heaven and a new earth i want you to see in point two the power of god i um i go a little different than what uh david jeremiah in if you follow along by reading the book of signs an excellent book that we've been enjoying I differ a little bit with the, the way that it was mentioned in the book of signs. Uh, there's kind of a difference on uh, some things here, but point two is different than what David Jeremiah has in the uh, book of signs. On our outline tonight, I have the power of God. And I think this is very important that we think about the power of God. And the first point is going to be kind of a review over what we've been studying the last several weeks. The order of events. I want to tell you that this order of events that I have on your outline is based upon what is called the premillennial return of Jesus. Pre means before. So this is under the idea that Jesus Christ will come first to set up the thousand year reign, the premillennial position. And this is also the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. So this is coming from the view of the premillennial return of Christ and the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. With that in mind, here's the order of events that we've kind of been looking through in the scriptures. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 3. I really believe that as Jesus has written these seven letters to the little churches, the churches of Asia Minor, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we see also, I believe, they're literal churches, but I think they're also symbolic of the different periods in the church age. And so I think we see something that we are currently I would believe wholeheartedly that we're in the Laodicean age, the Laodicean period of the church. Let's see about this church in, in Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. The church is today in its last age, the Laodicean period. Now, I believe wholeheartedly God is able and He can send revival. However, I don't believe that we're going to see this worldwide revival that some talk about. Uh, that doesn't mean there can't be an awakening. It doesn't mean that there can't be a, a revival in a you know, lo location. But we're not promised some major, uh, like a great awakening, before the rapture of the church. In fact, when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, what happens in the latter days, in the last days? Their love will go cold, and there's a, a sense of a, those that have the form of godliness, but denying the power therein. And that's the idea of, and, and also he talks about setting up 
teachers and the people having itching ears and wanting to hear certain things that don't line up with the scriptural teaching. You know, sometimes there can be such an emphasis on life now that they are forsaking and thinking about life forever and ever and ever, you know, eternity. And, and I think you have to, the scripture, we see that balance of how our eternal life affects our current life now. It affects how we live here now. And so let's look at the lay of the sin period. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel, the word means messenger. So we could say the pastor of the church in Laodicea write the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this. Who is de being described in verse 14? Jesus Christ. He's called the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning or the source of the creation of God says this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Now, Laodicea, you need to know this about this city. Laodicea had a, they, even though they were a very wealthy city and was known for their banking system, they were known for their ISAV, they were known for their uh, clothing industry. However, they had a major problem. They didn't have good water. They didn't have good water. And so what happened is the water had to be piped in to Laodicea. So the water would come from Hierapolis. And I always get this confused, but the, one of them had the hot springs. Then they would have that come in to Laodicea. And then you had from Colossae, the water would come in from Colossae, and that was the opposite, that was the cold springs. And so you had the cold springs coming in, you had the hot springs coming in. But by the time it gets to Laodicea, guess what temperature the water is? It's neither, it's neither cold nor hot. It's lukewarm. So the Laodiceans, when they hear this letter and say that you're neither cold nor hot, they could understand right away because of the situation of their water. And Jesus saying to them, I wish that you were either, he said, I wish that you were either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm. We don't use lukewarm water a lot. You know, people don't typically want their coffee or their tea lukewarm. They want it either hot or cold. They don't really want it lukewarm. And so what happens is, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. The idea is I will vomit you out. You ever been surprised by something, you know, a taste is totally different than what you expected? And so Jesus saying here, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. In verse 17, this is what they were saying about themselves. You say, I am rich. Remember the big banking system that they had? They have become wealthy, have need of nothing. We have everything we need. We're doing quite well. We have riches. We have all these things. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Can you imagine they were quite surprised when they heard this letter from the Lord? This is your true condition. You're completely missing it. You think you're doing quite well. You think you're fine. But Jesus said, here's the true spiritual condition. And then he said, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline therefore be zealous and repent Jesus is saying and I believe this is why the Laodicean period it's because out of God's love out of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ he is saying you are lukewarm I'm asking you to be zealous I'm asking you to, to repent. You're going the wrong direction spiritually. And then he said in verse 20, Behold, 
I stand at the door and knock. Where is he outside of? Literally here, he's outside the door of the church. He's outside the door of the church of Laodicea. And he's knocking. But he says, I will come into him. Now notice this, this is very important. This is an individual. If there's an individual, hear me knocking. Outside of the church, if there's an individual that hears me knocking and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. You know what that's a picture of? Sweet fellowship. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 22 is very important because he says, he who has an ear, individual. So individual believer, even though this letter is written to the church of Laodicea, the individual believers, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the Laodicean age or period of the church describing what we see here in Revelation chapter 3. The next prophetic event will be the what of the church? Rapture of the church. We've seen this description in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Following the rapture will come the tribulation. The tribulation, a period of seven years, it's called the hour of Jacob's trouble, but it's also referred to as the 70th week of Daniel. This last set of seven years in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27, it's when what starts the tribulation period, you had the rapture of the church, but what starts the tribulation period is when the Antichrist will make his covenant with Israel. When the Antichrist makes the covenant for how many years with Israel? Seven years. That's the 70th week, the 70th set of sevens. And so you have the 70th week. Well then, halfway through, the Antichrist will break his covenant with Israel. And that last three and a half years, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ called it great tribulation in Matthew 24. When you see the abomination of, de of desolation that Daniel spoke about, then woe be unto those that are pregnant in those days, those that would be uh, not to go down to their house, if, you know, to, to go to flee to the mountains. Why? Because the Antichrist will be seeking to destroy the Jews and believers in those last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. Well, the Tribulation comes to an end. We have the Battle of Armageddon. The nations have gathered to war. And Jesus Christ will literally come. With the second coming of Jesus Christ, He will set up His millennial kingdom. Remember we looked at that in Revelation 20 when Satan will be bound for those thousand years. Jesus will rule. This is fulfillment of the promise, the covenant with David, the eternal covenant that God made with David. So then he sets up the millennial kingdom. At the end of the kingdom time, well, we know that Satan has to be let loose after those thousand years for a little while to go and deceive the nations. And then they will, the, the multitudes are going to come against the Lord. And that will lead into the great white throne judgment that will occur. And this is when all the unsaved will be judged. There's no saved at the great white throne judgment. They're all unsaved that are judged there. Every one of them will be sentenced to damnation, to hell, the lake of fire out of the great white throne judgment. Peter refers to this as the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men in 2 Peter 3, 7. Well, point B, let's go now and see what happens 
in verse 10 of 2 Peter 3, the heavens will be dissolved. The heavens will be dissolved. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away. The word pass away is a translation of the Greek term meaning to loosen or to dissolve. And then he says, they will pass away with a roar. Kenneth Wiest in his word studies in the Greek New Testament writes about this. The word for roar was used of the whistling of an arrow, the sound of a shepherd's pipe, the rush of wings, the splash of water, the hissing of a snake. This is how the elements will be dissolved with a roar. Wiest also writes, literally, the elements being scorched up shall be dissolved. Will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. The Nelson Study Bible, there's a note that Peter's description requires the unlimited power of God in dissolving the very elements of the universe from which he will create a new heaven and a new earth. Some have taken because the word new can, is also used here as new in quality. So some say that means that he can take of the old and reshape, but I think he has the power to create. He, I, I believe he's going to create a new heaven, new earth, just like what we're going to see. Well, let's look at the principles of the new heaven and new earth. Go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. I think about that Southern Gospel song that said, this is what John saw, what he's recording. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And what's so different? There's no longer any sea. So point A is the removal of the sea. The removal of the sea. You know, boy, a lot of our earth is water, isn't it? There's a lot of water on the earth. There's a lot of water on the earth. But Revelation 21.1 says, In the new heaven, new earth, and there's no more sea. Dr. Henry Morris from the Book of Signs, the study guide, he wrote the following, There'll be, in fact, no need for sea on the new earth. The present sea is needed for a reservoir, for the maintenance of the hydrolog hydrologic cycle. When we think about this, you know, you think about the clouds and as they form in the rain and, and all the different things, but yet they don't fill up. I mean, there, there's a lot of water in the oceans and in the seas, but yet you think about that cycle. And then the moisture and then that is, is how that goes. And that is God his design. And it's amazing. But as Dr. Henry Morris was writing, in the new earth, all men and women who live there will have their glorified bodies with no more need of water. New glorified bodies, even as unto the Lord. The removal of the sea. Let's see in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 3 is the reversal of the curse. What is the creation doing right now? Romans says that creation is groaning to be loosed. Do you realize that creation was affected by the fall of Adam, the original sin? The curse on the ground we see in Genesis chapter 3. So not only is man affected, but even creation is. And creation is groaning to be released. So you have the reversal of the curse. Let's read what Revelation 22, 3 says. There will be no longer any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, 
and his bondservants will serve him. Go to Genesis chapter 3 and verses 17 and 19, through 19, and we'll see the curse. Genesis 3, verses 17 through 19. We see the curse come in because of sin. In verse 17, the Lord speaking to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Notice this, who commanded Adam not to eat of that fruit? The Lord did. The Lord said, don't eat from that fruit, from that tree, the, the fruit of that tree. The Lord commanded him. And you saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. The next time you're cleaning out your flower garden or various things and you see thorns and thistles, you can remember the curse. Because thorns and thistles in the ground. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Why is that the case? Because of sin entering in. There's going to be death. There's going to be death, physical death. So from, death you, from the dust you have come, and to dust you shall return as a result of the curse. But there's going to be a reversal of that curse. The curse will be dispelled forever. That leads us to point C, the restoration of all things. In Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Why? Verse 4, all those descriptions came as a result of the sin as a result of the fall of man, original sin. What came in? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There wasn't the tears before sin entered in. There wasn't the, uh, it said there will be no longer any death. Death came in as a result of the sin. There will no longer be any mourning. That came in with death and that came in with the pain. Mourning is, that came part with cause of original sin. Also, or crying or pain, those are all a result. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. New. No sign of mourning, no sign of pain, no sign of thorns and thistles. And all those things, as we think about the restoration of all things. I want to end by reading what David Jeremiah wrote in the book of Signs. He said, in his narrative about heaven, David Haney wrote about going to his favorite restaurant in Dallas, Texas, that features creative southwestern cuisine. The most famous item on the menu is a specially prepared ribeye steak. But the restaurant is also known for its extensive menu of exotic appetizers. One day, David sat down at his table and studied the menu and ordered a marvelous shrimp fajita appetizer that was unlike anything he had ever tasted in his life. I discovered taste buds that I did not even know I had, he said. I could not believe that anyone could make something so, out, uh, so odd sounding taste so good. When the waiter returned to inquire about the entree, David told him he didn't want to eat anything else all night. The shrimp fajita had done him in. 
And he didn't even plan to brush his teeth that evening because he wanted to savor the memory of the marvelous taste. But the waiter told him, if you thought that was good, just wait for the ribeye. <laughs> Afterward, David thought about the simple conversation and he pondered the whole idea of foretaste. In a sense, the beauties of our world, the hills, the plains, the mountains, the oceans, the spangling vault of heaven are like appetizers that whet our appetites for the main course for God's new creation. I don't know anything more about these realities than what the Bible tells us. Scripture is our only source of truth about the life hereafter. But based upon these biblical truths, I believe the same God who magnificently created this present world is preparing for the moment when he will make all things new. The scene in Revelation 21 and 22 is not some fictional uh, utopia. It's absolute re reality revealed for us in God's book, designed for us by God's heart, and provided for us by God's own Son. Looking forward. All things new. So how shall we now live in light of this? 2 Peter 3 gives us the answer. Verses 11 through 13 of 2 Peter 3. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements with, will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We are to live in holy conduct and godliness as we are looking and longing for the main course. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do stand in awe of the wonders of the beauty of this creation. Whether it's the majestic mountains or the refreshing streams, the beauty on a clear night to look up and see the stars. And even as the great hymn says that when we are in awesome wonder and considering all that your hands have made, how great you are. You are the eternal God. And we are here only a, a, a matter of a, just like a vapor or a shadow. But Lord, when we are in heaven, even 10,000 years, we've just only begun to sing your praises. You're making all things new. And we do long for that truth. And Lord, we pray as even as Peter wrote, the lives of godliness and holy conduct in light of that truth, longing, longing for what you will make new. Help us as we leave here tonight, we worship you, we thank you. And you will do exactly what your word says. Lord, as you give us opportunities this week, to be your witnesses. Oh, your desire to reconcile a lost world to yourself, that we could carry the word of reconciliation. You have given each believer the ministry of reconciliation. All oh, the longing is that sinners to be reconciled to you, a holy, righteous God. And you made it possible through the work of Jesus at the cross. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be your witnesses, empowers us to speak, and we allow you 
the results, that belongs to you, Lord. But we just aren't want to be obedient to you. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.